It's a Friday edition of PFTPM. Joining us now, the man who is in charge of the NFL's response to an unprecedented challenge as the pandemic intersects with professional football. It's Chief Medical Officer Alan Sills joining us this morning. Dr. Sills, great to see you as always. How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing great, Mike. Thanks for having me. Hey, it's great to have you. And one of the things that I've been kicking around is I try to better understand how a pandemic works and how a pandemic meshes, if at all, with professional sports. And we've seen it play out with different sports over the past several months. From your perspective, I mean, you have spent your life, your professional life, focused on brain health, on brain surgery. How hard has it been for you to pivot to becoming essentially on the fly an expert in epidemiology? Well, Mike, I'm certainly not becoming an expert in epidemiology, but I think this is something that's been hard for all of us in the medical world. Uh, none of us have experienced anything like this before in our medical careers. Um, we've obviously seen various epidemics, but this one is very unique. So I think that's why it's become very much a team effort. Um, we've had to, certainly for me personally, I've had to lean on the expertise and advice of many different people who are infectious disease experts, population health experts, epidemiologists, and certainly my colleagues in sports medicine uh, around the world with other professional sports leagues. So we've had to collaborate, communicate with each other because all of us are in uncharted waters here. And the good news is that we can learn from each other. And I think that's been one of the very gratifying things about this pandemic is this hasn't been about what the NFL is doing or the NBA. This has been about us as a medical community trying to proactively address uh, what is a, a very novel and emerging virus. And so we've had more communication collaboration than we probably ever had before across all of those leagues and all of those different levels of expertise. Which league would you say you've learned the most from? Well, it'd be hard to say anyone because every single person has, has been very instructive. I mean, I think, uh, again, I talk regularly each week with Major League Baseball, with NBA, with National Hockey League, with Major League Soccer, but we've also talked with Australian Football League, with Rugby, we've talked with the Bundesliga, the English Premier League. So I have to say, Mike, every single one of them has, has added something and has expanded our thinking. And, and again, we've shared in both directions what we're doing, listening to what they're doing. And I think that communication will continue. How much has it added to the challenge for the NFL to successfully pull off the season, given that places like Germany, where the Bundesliga plays, England, where the Premier League plays, those places seem to have, as a society, done better getting the virus under control, getting to the other side of the pandemic. Not that it's gone, but they've handled it better than we have as a country. How much has that complicated the effort to play football in this climate? Well, I think it's no doubt that the situation in our country is more challenging. As you mentioned, some of those other countries have done a much better job or have, have had you know f fewer cases and the pandemic is at a different state. And so it, it does make our job more complex in America. But I, again, I think each country is unique, each population is unique, each sport is unique. As you know, there are different risk levels and there are different things we can do to mitigate risk. Uh, among our different sports. But but I think we, we all clearly realize we have a huge challenge on our hands. This is really hard. Uh, this isn't just hard for us as the NFL or pro sports. This is hard for us as a country. How are we going to try to navigate our way through this pandemic? And, and really, in a sense, Mike, can we learn to live with this virus? Because from what I read and hear and see, and I'm sure you do the same things, I don't expect that this is going to go away or disappear anytime soon. So it's it's not about waiting for that day when it disappears. We all hope that day is, is not far off. But until it does, what can we do to mitigate risk and try to establish some sense of normalcy around our lives, but do so in a thoughtful and safe way? I think that's the question that not just the NFL is trying to answer or other sports leagues, but that's what schools and businesses and places of worship, we all have that very same objective and, and that very same challenge. I agree with you completely on that point, that we have to assume it's going to hang around, maybe for multiple NFL seasons. And you're in a far better position than I am to understand the issues to grasp the nuances. But the one thing to me that seems to be the topic that would most affect the NFL, point of care testing. When point of care testing is available at a sufficiently high accuracy rate where you can essentially set up a barrier into the team facility, into the stadium, onto the bus, onto the plane, wherever you decide to have the testing that gives you a result then and there, 
positive or negative, that you can trust. That seems to be the thing that will change everything for the NFL. Am I wrong in thinking that? Well, I, I, I would agree and disagree with part of that, and let me explain. Absolutely, we would all love to have accurate, immediate, uh, of the widely available point-of-care testing. Again, that's not just something in the NFL. That's across our medical enterprise is everyone would like to have a more accurate, more widely available test. So full stop, that will be a, a step forward for everyone. But I think we also have to recognize what the limitations of testing are. Testing is not prevention. Testing is about containment. So testing doesn't prevent you from getting the virus in the first place. What prevents you from getting the virus are things like wearing a mask, physical distancing, staying away from sick people, staying home if you're sick, staying away from crowded places. And all of those risk mitigation strategies are not going to change no matter what the status of testing is. So testing is important. It's certainly something that's part of a chain, but, but I think of all these different links in the chain, and there are many other links that I think are, are equally important with testing. So love to see point of care tests available, but it's not going to change that fundamental need to still do all those other things that keep people safe because masks, distancing, staying home when you're sick, staying away from sick people, those things are about prevention. Testing is about containment. But as it currently stands, when you've got a 24 hour lag between sample collection and test result, if you have somebody who had been negative, 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 you find out tomorrow that today is the day he's positive. Ideally, that is a donut hole that the NFL would love to close. No question, would love to close that, but I'd go back again and say, if in that 24 hour period that you mentioned, that individual has stayed physically distant, has worn a mask, done all of those things, then, then again, there should be a margin of safety there uh, for the individual and for the others. And, and that's why we have to recognize, Mike, in medicine, there's almost no test that's going to be 100% accurate all the time. So even as these tests get better and better, we still have to realize, hey, the test could be wrong. It could be a false negative. So that's why we still have to do all of those other measures and protect ourselves no matter what the test results are telling us. And by all accounts, the measures that have been put in place at the various teams are excellent. I remember seeing the memo that was distributed to the teams June 7 with the first cut of what the protocols would be. And it is detailed, it is thorough, and it creates a sense that the team facilities will be safe. The traveling squad, when you go on the bus, the plane, to the hotels, it will be safe. At the stadium, everyone will be safe. But then at some point, football gets played. <laughs> and that's the juxtaposition that I struggle with the most, that we can cross every T and dot every I and keep everyone apart and wear masks and be safe. But then it's 11 on 11 football with guys lined up right across from each other, breathing and sweating and spitting and bleeding. And how do we reconcile all the things we're doing to keep guys safe for the 153 hours a week? They're not in a game and then to keep them safe for the three hours when they're out there in that mix of other human beings who may be positive and we just don't know it yet. Yeah, well, I think you framed it exactly right. If we can do everything right in those 153 hours leading up to the game, then that's going to make it safer during that three-hour period because we're hopefully going to arrive at the field with everyone who's not infected. And so you exactly described it. Doing it right all the time leading up to the game is what helps us get to the game site uh, with hopefully no infections in anyone that's participating. And in the same way, that's why we'll do pregame testing again to try to add to that, that knowledge base. But, but we've said all along, Mike, you're right. Physical distance and football, they don't go together. You can't play football and be physically distant, or at least you can't play it very well in most positions. So I think you have to, to look at how do we arrive there in an uninfected state, and then certainly we will look at and learn from what happens on the field as well. I do think there's some things you can do during that three hour period, how you construct your benches, what people do when they're off the field, you know, minimizing risks at other times in and around who's in that environment, who's coming through the bench area. Those things are all going to matter. The other thing we have to recognize is we'll continue to learn from other sports leagues here. As I mentioned, we've talked with, for example, Australian football with rugby. They're not exact parallels to NFL football, but, there, but there's a lot of face-to-face -face contact and in those sports with unhelmeted players. So we'll take away some learnings from that. And, and to date, you know, knock on wood, um, they've not seen on-field transmission. But, but I think it's something we have to continue to be vigilant about. We'll also get a lot of data. You've heard about those chips that we're using for proximity tracing. And we'll understand a lot more about the interactions on the field, who really is around who and for what period of time. So it is clearly a vulnerability and something we have to continue to address uh, as aggressively as we can.
And there's an avalanche of information out there about this virus. It's impossible to keep up with it. But one thing that has landed on my radar screen, and I know that there's a belief in some league circles that this will be true, that on-field transmission, either in an open-air stadium or in a dome that has a state-of-the-art ventilation system, that that is going to be far more difficult than transmission in a confined space indoors. How confident are we as of right now that there will be a significant difference between transmission rates in a building versus transmission rates on a football field? Well, Mike, I think like you said, a lot of experts that I talk to feel like that'll be the case, but the, the reality is we're still learning about that. We, we don't have a season of football or any even games to, to, to sort of vet, vet that hypothesis. That has been the experience of these other sports leagues around the world that I mentioned that have started up. And again, I think the, the population health and epidemiology experts I talk to, they do believe that these open air environments, as you said, either inside or outside in the ventilation, that it will help. So again, I think it's, it, there, there's a lot there that, that we can be somewhat reassured by, but there's gonna be no substitute for us actually getting into it, gathering the data, looking at it very carefully, and then adjusting. I think, Mike, one of the things we've said throughout is we're gonna have to be flexible and adaptable because we're gonna continue to learn things, not only from our own experience, but from these other leagues. And as we learn those things, we'll have to fine tune what we're doing. You mentioned all those protocols and we spent hours and hours and hours putting those together with a, a wide variety of experts. But those protocols will change, they'll grow and they'll develop and they'll get better. That's kind of the nature of medicine is we're always learning and improving. And I think that'll be the case here. One other issue as we look for potential risks that would either bring the virus to the facility or take the virus out of the facility if an outbreak happens is the concept of players going home every night. And I know that mm -hmm. a full league-wide bubble like the NBA and the NHL are doing is completely impractical. Too many teams, too many people, too much time, too much expense. It doesn't make sense. Has any thought been given to the possibility of hardening the bubble around the 32 teams. And I know this would be a major hardship for the players and their families and the coaches and their families, but basically sequestering the team from the rest of the world, staying in a facility, staying in a hotel. Matt Ryan, the Falcons quarterback, told us the other day they have townhouses at their facility where they have individual bathrooms and changing areas and beds. Has there been any thought been given to the possibility of having a hard bubble around the 32 teams and having the players and the coaches and everyone else who's essential to the operation be there all season long without ever leaving? Well, we've certainly talked about and debated every idea, including that idea, and, and been very tried to be very open-minded and thoughtful about that. And we've looked at a, a number of different scenarios. And I think we landed on something that we feel combines the margin of safety with the practicality that you mentioned. But I like to describe what we're doing is, is what we call a virtual football bubble, which means when guys are at the facility, we know that we've got the protocols, we've got everything in place. We've done a lot of work and together with the Players Association around education, what do you do when you leave the facility? And it's our hope that players, coaches, and staff, because again, this isn't just about players, it's about everybody, that they are gonna primarily go home. It's not to say they're never gonna leave their homes, but they're, they're, when they do go out, they're gonna use the appropriate preventive measures and do all they can to keep themselves safe. So in a sense, it's, it is that bubble concept, but it's just extended out to each individual player's environment. And again, as you point out, you have to rely on each person to make really important choices about what they do and trying to mitigate risk for themselves. But I would just point back, Mike, again, to being flexible and adaptable. As we get into the season and we see what the data shows us, we're going to remain open to all of these different scenarios and seeing what seems to be the most effective. So you're saying there is a possibility at some point if there are outbreaks that there could be a sequestration of players and coaches and teams in a hotel or in a facility? I think all options are on the table. We've said that we are going to continue to evaluate at every point and do what's safest for, for everyone involved. And so, I, you know, best way I can answer that is to say all options remain on the table and we'll have to uh, deal with each situation as it comes up in what we think is the safest and most thoughtful way. Last one for you, and I appreciate you giving us so much time today. As it relates to the current model, the virtual bubble, as you explained it, with players going home at the end of the day, how much of the success or failure of that model hinges on whether or not schools are open because the player can do all the right things, but if they have kids that are in school and they're at school and they get the virus and bring it home, player gets the virus and brings it to the facility, 24 hour lag between sample collection and test result, the virus has gotten into the building. 
Yeah, it's a great question, Mike. And again, it's something that's still being studied. Again, not just for an NFL setting, but you know, how frequently are kids vectors and how do they transmit? What do those rates look like? And even within households, this is something that's still somewhat of a mystery about this virus. You would think that if someone in the household is infected, that 100% of those close contacts in the household would get infected. And that doesn't seem to happen. And we don't really understand why. Why is it that in some situations, everyone in the house is completely safe and in other situations, they become infected. So, so it, it is a vulnerability. I think, again, we've done a tremendous amount of education, as has the Players Association, to players and their families. Uh, for example, I've been on several Zoom calls just this week with, with organizations where it was players and families gathered together. And we've talked with, with spouses and, and you know household cohabitants and children about these issues. And everyone is gonna be in this together in the sense of trying to make these good choices and, and do what they can to mitigate risk. So um, again, it is very much more so than ever. It's not trying to say this is a team effort and, and every single person in that team ecosystem is gonna have responsibility to each other person. That's one thing that's been very encouraging to me as the players return and the coaches send a message and the players send a message, the more guys buy into it and their families buy into it and understand that everyone needs to be buttoned up across the board for this to work. Hopefully that will happen. Hopefully we'll get our 256 regular season games, 13 postseason games with minimal outbreaks. Dr. Sills, we appreciate your time today. We wish you all the best as you embark on a challenge that no NFL chief medical officer has ever embarked on. We wish you the best with that. And we hope to talk to you down the road. Hey, thanks very much. Appreciate it. Best wishes to you. And I'll uh, look forward to catching up down the road. All right, take care. All right, that was Dr. Alan Sills, the NFL's chief medical officer. This is PFTPM. I wasn't planning to add anything beyond our interview with Dr. Sills. 16 minutes, decent length, but I wanted to answer some questions today. I know it's been a while since we've done that. And also, there's some news, a little Friday afternoon news dumpage from the NFL. We've been waiting and waiting and waiting for the league to do something with Antonio Brown. You know my feelings on it. I have had a very strong conviction that the league has taken full advantage of its ability under the personal conduct policy to drag its feet, which it's done for 11 months with three different incidents involving Antonio Brown that have not been resolved. Well, as of today, they are resolved according to NFL media, which is the NFL. Two of the three incidents are covered by an eight-game suspension that was levied by the league. Now, by way of a refresher, first incident, an accusation of sexual assault and rape made in a lawsuit filed last September. Second incident, a claim made by a woman regarding a completely separate incident that Antonio Brown harassed her via text message after she went public to SI.com with her concerns. Third incident, the felony arrest of Antonio Brown after an altercation with a moving truck driver, reportedly because Brown didn't want to pay the bill for the items that were being delivered to his home in South Florida. He has since pleaded no contest to felony charges. So that's the one that was most clearly on the T for punishment because the case fully and finally resolved, nothing further to be investigated, nothing further for the NFL to do. Now, according to NFL media, again, which is the NFL, the eight game suspension covers the altercation with a moving truck driver and the allegation made by the woman who claimed she was harassed by Antonio Brown after raising some concerns to SI.com. The original incident, the one that got all of this started, that incident still unresolved by the NFL. And I get the impression based upon the reporting from NFL media, i.e. the NFL, that the league is going to wait and see what happens in the civil lawsuit before making a decision on whether or not Antonio Brown should be disciplined for that claim. Now, even though it's not a criminal case, the claim made in this civil lawsuit is a serious one, sexual assault and rape. And if the league believes Antonio Brown raped the woman that's suing him for sexual assault and rape, he should never play in the NFL again. So, when you consider the NFL's had a chance to interview her, chance to interview him, chance to do whatever other investigation it needs to do, it doesn't have to wait for the civil lawsuit to be resolved. Make a decision. He did it or he didn't do it. See, I think the NFL is concerned about the possibility that the league would find that he didn't do it. And then there'd be a verdict in a civil lawsuit at some point down the road that he did do it. The NFL would look foolish finding he's blameless 
but then having a jury find that, oh, by the way, we believe he committed sexual assault and or rape. But in this setting, I don't know that waiting makes a whole lot of sense. When you're not talking about a criminal case, you're talking about a civil claim with a low standard. It goes one way or the other. It depends upon who the jury believes. The NFL needs to decide who it believes. The NFL has had the opportunity to speak to the people involved. The NFL has had an opportunity to come to a conclusion. Come to a conclusion. Put this behind everyone. He did it or he didn't do it. If you believe him, don't suspend him for it. Clear him of it and move forward. If you don't believe him, then you believe he committed rape. Then tell him he can never play in the NFL again, period. The other thing that's embedded in this, and I assume based upon the way this has happened, that he won't land on the commissioner exempt list if he's signed. But the NFL seems to be acknowledging that the claim of sexual assault and rape made in a civil setting is not enough standing alone to result in Antonio Brown being placed on paid leave because that claim is still out there. Now, I don't know whether they just don't want to focus on that to crystallize and articulate exactly what this suspension means. If again, the report from NFL media, which is the NFL is accurate that only two of the three claims have been resolved, but this donut hole is just strange that you've made the guy wait for this long, that he served a 14 game unpaid suspension because no team was going to sign him and risk having to pay him not to play because of the belief he would have been put on the commissioner exempt list. Well, now we resolve two of the three claims. The one that's left is the claim for sexual assault and rape. And he's apparently not going to be put on the commissioner exempt list if he's signed, unless somebody gets the ultimate surprise where they sign Antonio Brown. The league says, all right, the eight game suspension applies and then he can play for you. The eight game suspension comes and goes. He gets ready to play and the league says, well, you know what? We're going to put him on the commissioner exempt list because of the unresolved claim of sexual assault and rape. This is an unresolved claim of sexual assault and rape. Either resolve it or acknowledge we can't resolve it. And I don't know what you do if you, I, I mean, I, that, that, see, I really think that this is all driven by the concern that if the league were to exonerate him, if the league were to find he didn't commit sexual assault and or rape, and if the league concluded that, I don't know why he ever plays it. If you find he didn't do it and a civil jury proves you wrong, then you have an even bigger PR mess. And make no mistake about it, this entire mechanism is driven by PR. It's not driven by some sense of justice and fairness, and we're going to do the right thing, and we're going to supplement the justice system, and we have our own in-house justice system to deal with these. No. This entire effort to police the private lives of players is about PR. It's about having guys employed who have been accused of doing horrible things while not at work. And it was supplemented six years ago with the opportunity to put the players on paid leave when the allegations are so strong that they can't have the guy around. And, you know, the league's position on all of this is that uh, it's not punishment to put a guy on paid leave, which is completely misguided because players want to play football. Of course, it's punishment to not let someone play and to just pay their salary. It's a cynical view of how players operate. I just look, I'm glad they've finally done something, but they still have left a major question unresolved and who knows when it will be resolved. But apparently they're not going to put him on the commissioner exempt list. And now someone can sign him. So who's going to sign him? The two leading candidates seem to be the Seahawks and the Ravens. I continue that the Ravens don't really want to sign him, but they don't want to tell him no because they don't want to give him reason to poison his cousin Marquise Hollywood Brown against the team for which Marquise Hollywood Brown plays. So you kind of hold him at arm's length. You don't say yes, you don't say no, and you wait and you hope and you pray that the Seahawks give the guy a job. Because if you tell him no, he isn't going to be happy, obviously. Sign him and it goes sideways and you have to cut him, he's not going to be happy. So, you know, it's just one of those strange, awkward things for the Ravens where I think they don't want him.
Just yesterday, John Harbaugh, the coach of the team, said, I don't even think he's available to be signed now. Well, he was. He always has been available to be signed. The concern was if you sign him, he lands on the commissioner exempt list. Now, some clarity. If you sign him, he can be with you for training camp. And then when training camp ends and the week one preparations begin in earnest, that's when he begins his eight-game suspension, apparently without fear of being placed on the commissioner exempt list, but with possibility hovering that if and when the civil lawsuit is resolved, there will be another punishment imposed by the league. If I were Antonio Brown, I would do what should have been done a long time ago, what should have been done before that lawsuit was even filed. Write the check to settle the case. Whatever it takes, make that case go away. Should have done it before it was ever filed. Should definitely do it now because if he wants to come back and play in the NFL, you don't want to have this hanging over you. All right, time to answer some of your questions. I know it's been a while. I understand. And I've finally given in to the clamoring from the PFTPM Posse, the official Twitter account that was set up to speak as the voice of the fans, a few as they may be, of the PFTPM podcast. Here's the first question, and it relates to this whole concept of the commissioner exempt list. How and why did the NFLPA allow the commissioner's exempt list to morph without fighting it? It started as a list teams placed players on. 2009, the Eagles put Mike Vick there. 2013, Jeff Demps was there while he pursued the Olympics. And then in 2014, it morphed with Ray Rice, Greg Hardy, Adrian Peterson. Well, the NFLPA did push back against it. The NFLPA did fight it. The problem is that the NFL already has the discretion and the authority to do this. And the NFL's position was and still is that you can put a player on paid leave and not take away any of his money, and therefore it's not punishment. And they did fight it out. And the NFLPA lost. And the NFL secured the right to aggressively apply the personal conduct policy in a way that allows them to put players on paid leave, period. So don't blame the union on this. This is something the union fought. It's something the NFL has the right to do. And any of these personal conduct policy issues, you know, the problem is the rank and file generally, the vast majority of the players will never be caught up in the gears of the personal conduct policy. They don't really benefit from any enhancements to the rights of specific players who find themselves in trouble with the NFL. So what rights are players going to give up across the board to advance the rights of a narrow handful of players, one or two a year at most, that find themselves at the mercy of the NFL's personal conduct policy? That's the ever-present challenge. And the thing I don't like about the personal conduct policy, as I've said time and again, there are no deadlines. There is no, you must issue a decision within X days of doing an investigation. You must complete an investigation within X days of having the reason for the investigation land on your radar screen. You must have a hearing by this. You must do this. There's none of that. There's none of that. And again, if you're a player who's minding his own business, who never anticipates being in trouble with the league, are you going to give up any of your rights to secure better treatment for that small handful of guys who find themselves in trouble. And for most of the guys who find themselves in trouble, it's easy to look at them if you're a player and say it's your own damn fault. If you wouldn't have done X, Y, or Z, you wouldn't be in this situation where the NFL is potentially screwing you under a personal conduct policy that is stacked against the rights of players. All right, next question, PFTPM Posse. How does the salary cap carryover impact the formula that determines the amount of cap space each team and all teams combined have to spend cash per year and the rolling four-year average under the CBA. I think it's two separate things. There's a requirement that on a four-year rolling average, I think it's now 95% of the money must be spent by each team on a four-year rolling average of the total cap. And every year there's a set number. It's it's 95%. It may be higher under the new CBA of the total money that needs to be spent under the cap. Carryover doesn't matter. Carryover is a cap device. It's not a cash spending device. You still have to spend a certain amount of cash, even if you're carrying over cap space. That's my general understanding of it. Uh, You know, there haven't been any teams that have gotten themselves into any type of trouble with failing to spend the minimum amount. But the bottom line is this. I think the number was 89% per team on a four-year rolling average with a 95% per year total league expenditure of cap dollars. Under the old CBA, you know, under the old CBA, you could put 11 cents per dollar into your pocket 
under the cap every year as raw profit and never spend that money. And I think they inched it up a little bit. There's been so much going on lately. I don't remember it off the top of my head without researching it. But I think those floors came up some. But look, I, I think it should be 100% every year. I think teams should be required to spend the full amount of the salary cap. It should be a floor and a cap that are the same amount. The idea is we're putting the cap in place so teams don't go crazy and spend the league into oblivion. Fine. Well, that should be the minimum everyone's required to spend that. Because the idea is you're protecting the teams from themselves. There should be an understanding that that's the amount that will be spent. And again, they've done work to increase those expenditures and get the money in the hands of the players. And of course, this year and next year, it's complicated by the pandemic. And I continue to say, watch for teams to choose to cut expensive veteran players or to squeeze them to take less to save dollars this year when they expect to have significant losses due to the absence of fans at games and to maybe have some cap money that can be carried over to next year when the cap is expected to be $175 million per team, which is $23.2 million less per team than this year. The best way to deal with that drop in the salary cap is to find a way to carry some cap space over and maybe you bump it back up and you don't have to take extreme measures next year to make sure you have all the guys you want on the team Day one, ready to go. Next question. Another question from PFTPM Posse. What's the latest the 2020 season could end? And what is the latest the 2021 season could start without everything being thrown out of whack? The NFL hasn't said anything about this other than the flexibility has been built in to have the Super Bowl in Tampa as late as the final weekend in February. I think they'd like to get it all done by the end of February. Presumably, you would have to move the scouting combine a week or two to accommodate that. And who knows if a scouting combine can even happen if the pandemic hasn't improved dramatically by then. The only reason the combine happened this year is they slipped it in before the pandemic was declared. None of the other stuff prior to the draft occurred. There may be no combine in 2021 until they have point of care testing, which allows people to find out whether or not someone is positive or negative in a reliable fashion right now, not tomorrow, but right now, or until there's a vaccine, I think it becomes impossible as a practical matter to have a scouting combine. So I don't know, maybe they can, I, I, I don't know, maybe, I, I hate the idea of a March Super Bowl, but I feel like they're determined to get the Super Bowl in no matter what. They're going to complete the season, but the commissioner has pivoted from saying we're determined to play a full season to we're determined to play a complete season. Complete season just means at the end of the day, the confetti is fired and here's the trophy. 1982 with nine regular season games due to the strike was a complete season. 1987 with 15 games due to the strike, three of which played by replacement players, completed season. So they're going to have a Super Bowl. And I just think they're going to do what they have to do to get the Super Bowl played. They're not just going to say we'll have no Super Bowl this year. Think of the money that is lost by not having 120 million people tune in simultaneously to watch the Super Bowl. They will play a Super Bowl. And if the union agrees to it, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. March, April, I don't know. No one knows. These are all things that fall into the category of the stuff we're just going to have to sit back and wait and watch for. And that's what I encourage everyone to do. I got no problem with the question being asked, but I think the practical outcome of all of this is we're just going to have to wait and see. We're going to have to wait and see. Ideally, they're not going to want to delay the start of the next season. And really, I think by the time point of care testing comes online, the NFL's experience becomes a lot simpler. Yes, you still have guys infected if they're doing stupid things when they go home or if their kids are in school and they're bringing the virus home. But if you have reliable 99% accurate point of care testing, your chances of outbreaks on your team, your chances of outbreaks at games go down dramatically. That's when I think the NFL is on the other side, it's not here yet. There was a belief it would be here by August or September. If it gets here by October, November, that seems to be the point where everything gets easier for the NFL. And I continue to believe that the NFL should strongly consider mini bubbles, hard bubbles, hotel for all of the players, coaches, and essential staff away from their fans. I know it won't be easy. But if you want to increase the likelihood of getting the games in, you do that and point of care testing is developed at the high enough level that that can confidently keep out anyone 
who may be positive and shedding the virus without that 24 hour donut hole, where in theory, a guy could test Saturday, show up Sunday, he's negative for Saturday, he takes the test Sunday, and he finds out on Monday he was positive on Sunday. And oh, by the way, he happened to play a three hour game with teammates and opponents. And he was in the presence of officials and coaches, et cetera. That's the concern until we have point of care testing. PFT PM Posse, one more from that account. What impact will the Mahomes contract have on the overall quarterback market in the next few years? I frankly believe it will have none. I think it's going to be viewed as the albatross, the outlier, the aberration, the thing that other players will look at and say, this just doesn't apply to us. Now, look, players can't have it both ways. If you are the next guy up, you can't say, hey, I want a four-year extension worth $45 million per year or $45.5 million per year to get past Mahomes. To get to $45 million a year, to move the bar by $10 million, think about that. The high water mark in new money average for a quarterback contract went from $35 million to $45 million in one fell swoop. But to get to $45 million, Pat Mahomes had to agree to a 10-year extension, a 12-year contract. So whether it's Dak Prescott, whether it's Kyler Murray, whether it's Lamar Jackson, whether it's Russell Wilson, the next time he's up for a new deal, whoever it is, I think that that a good agent is going to say, don't bring that Mahomes structure around here. And it's going to be interesting to see what Lamar Jackson does because he doesn't have an agent. Will the Ravens just take the Mahomes contract and offer the same thing? To Lamar Jackson now, the $140 million in injury guarantees may be a little more meaningful to Jackson because he has a style of play that makes him more likely to get injured. But tying the guy to the team and not forcing the team to keep the guy, not guaranteeing the money in full. And I understand the guarantee mechanisms make it a little more expensive than it would be, but it isn't a true two-way guarantee. It's a 12-year commitment by the player and not a 12-year commitment by the team. And I think for other quarterbacks, it's something that you just look at. If you're the agent, you say, it, it, this is just, it doesn't matter. It does not matter. And, uh, you know, we want a four-year extension, a five-year extension, max, maybe a three-year extension, which Deshaun Watson is trying to get. And, and I don't think that other quarterbacks, if they have good agents, are going to have that Mahomes structure and that Mahomes duration as some sort of a ball and chain that they have to deal with. All right. Leapers 500, how does the league maintain competitive balance if whole swaths of a team are positive and need two weeks off at least? Say half or more of the offensive line. What if a star goes down? How many games can they cancel or postpone? It seems dubious. Here's the thing. Look, the, the prospect of a star player getting injured is always there. Week one, torn ACL. Early day of training camp, torn ACL. Ruptured Achilles tendon, something that knocks the guy out for the year. That's always there. As it relates to COVID-19 and as it relates to the possibility of an outbreak, I think that's where this discretion that the commissioner apparently will have kicks in. Peter King has talked about it. We addressed it today on PFT Live. Sean Payton, who's a member of the competition committee, made reference earlier in the week to this notion that there may be games that are suspended if, for example, an entire position group is wiped out. I just don't know what it's going to take to have a standard that is fair, that is consistent, and that avoids the inevitable criticism that one team was allowed to skip a game that it surely would have lost when another team had to go out and play with a similar circumstance. Let's say one team has no offensive linemen who are healthy. Well, you're allowed to postpone the game. Another team has no defensive linemen who are healthy. Well, you have to play. What's the reaction to that going to be? And Will there be a different standard if the game is to be played in the cluster of one o'clock Eastern games on a Sunday versus Thursday night, Monday night, Sunday night? Will the bar be higher to postpone a game for which there is no other game to watch? Or will they on the fly, consider this, on the fly, flex a game into Sunday night? Ravens Steelers due to play at one o'clock. Bears Packers playing at 820 on NBC. Bears have no healthy offensive line. 
the commissioner exercises his prerogative to postpone the Bears-Packers game. And instead of having nothing on Sunday night, you just move the game. Ravens-Steelers, you're playing at 8.20 instead of 1 o'clock. The fact that fans aren't going to be at these games, or if they are, it's not going to be many fans, that makes it easier to just move the games around. Remember the playoff game between the Chiefs and the Steelers a few years ago? There was an ice storm in Kansas City. I would just move it tonight. See, all of these things that may be necessitated by the pandemic have happened in one form or fashion. Remember the game between the Vikings and the Eagles due to the blizzard, move from Sunday to Tuesday? There's all sorts of flexibility. The thing is, though, that possibility of the necessity of flexibility will pop up over and over and over again. We think. We don't know. I continue to believe the NFL is hell-bent on playing all of the week one games and then regrouping and reassessing. Week two, remember, every game played in week two is between teams who have their buys the same week. You could wipe out week two and move all those games to the bye weeks. Or if there are outbreaks in some cities, you can just postpone a couple of those games to the bye weeks of the teams involved. Week three, week four, no divisional games. Those weeks could be wiped out. They could be tacked on to the end of the season. There's a lot of flexibility after week one. So I think that's the plan. Play week one and then see what happens. That's the T-shirt slogan for the NFL this year. You know, every high school team, every college team, and most pro teams, I think they do. I don't know. They have that no pain, no gain, right? Let's see what happens. Is the unofficial T-shirt slogan for football at every level, at least football that intends to go forward at every level, because the pandemic is ultimately going to decide whether or not football is going to work. And let's hope it does. All right. Hopefully we've dispensed with this nonsense take that by raising the concerns, we're in some way rooting against football. What a crock of crap that is. No, we choose not to be willfully blind and willfully ignorant of things that make us uncomfortable. We're not going to apply to the realities of science the same dynamics that so many of us apply to political takes or facts we just don't want to hear that cut against our beliefs. Plug your ears and say, I'm not listening. You know, that's fine when those facts don't constitute scientific reality that we all have to deal with. So hopefully the NFL can get the games in and do it in a way that's fair. My nose is itchy. And do it in a way that's fair and do it in a way that gets as many games played as possible. And if you listen to the Alan, St Alan Sills interview from earlier in the show, the message, all options are on the table. Don't be afraid to take that team and put it in a mini bubble, in a hotel, in a facility, in a wherever, away from the rest of society to ensure that the virus stays out. All right, next question. Venet, Virginia, why do we need a national anthem before games to avoid any issues between player opinions or fans watching at home? Would the NFL ever go without a national anthem at the, at the start of games? That came up three years ago, and it's an easy response. Just get rid of it. Why do we do it? When did this become a thing? When did pausing to have an acknowledgement of the fact that, yes, we are in the United States of America? I mean, were we confused? Did we think we woke up today in Bolivia? Uh, I, I'm not trying to be – I guess I am trying to be sarcastic. I'm trying to prove a point here. When did it become part and parcel of sports? Why does it have to be part and parcel of sports? I mean, there is a political component to the mere fact that you play the national anthem before sporting events. It doesn't need to happen. It doesn't have to happen. We know where we live. We don't need to do it just because there's going to be a contest between one team and another team that's going to have a winner. I mean, I had a bunch of trials when I was practicing law. We didn't do the national anthem before we started a trial. We didn't say the Pledge of Allegiance before we started a trial. They don't do the national anthem before they remove someone's kidney. Why did the national anthem get caught up in this activity. Why? It's a fair question. And it would go a long way to, toward resolving these issues permanently if we would just accept and agree. We don't need it. We don't need it. It's superfluous. 
we know where we live. There are occasions where it's appropriate to play the national anthem. It's appropriate to say the Pledge of Allegiance. I don't know, is it, a, is it something that's spilled over from the Olympics? But the Olympics, it makes sense. You win a gold medal, you're from a certain country, it's part of the ceremony. It's the ending, not the beginning. You won the gold medal, you stand on the podium, they play your national anthem. That makes sense. Until the NFL has teams throughout the world, which maybe it will at some point, tying it to a national anthem, when all the teams are American, it really does make no sense. And, and is it, I, I feel like, you know, you got to tiptoe on eggshells. Is it political to believe that or to suggest that? That it's unnecessary? That maybe it was political for someone to begin doing it in the first place? And that maybe the best way to deal with it is to just not have it? Is that anti-American to think that? Or is it just pro cali pro, let's find ways to remove the things that potentially divide us. Let's find a way to unite us. If sports is supposed to unite us, and if all these people who want us to not ever mention politics, if that's the way they want it, then I don't know, maybe the national anthem doesn't have a place at sporting events. All right, Leapers 500. Why is it even in matters of life and death, the amateur cynic in our national character, the anti-intellectual gets as much sway as the people who put the time and effort and mind into learning a craft is it our own insecurity. I, I, I just think that what's going on with the pandemic is an extension of what we have become as a people on all matters of politics. If we don't like a certain fact, if a certain fact does not mesh with our worldview or our political opinions, we just ignore it or we dispute it. I remember back during the lockout in 2011, D. Smith, the executive director of the NFLPA would say, we're all entitled to our own opinions, we're not entitled to our own facts. We have developed a sense of entitlement to our own facts in the past decade or so, driven by political disagreement. But now we are at a point where there should be one set of facts that controls regarding how you get the virus, how you spread the virus, what you should do to limit the spread, what you should do to protect yourself, what you should do to protect others. It should be undisputed. But this concept that everything has two sides, everything doesn't have to have two sides. The sun rising in the east does not have a second side. But, you know, again, we live in an era where there are people who think the earth is flat. We live in an era where the strangest conspiracy theories take root and people rally around them. And it makes no sense. And it's concerning. It would be nice if we as a people could sign on to undisputed factual information. It really is 1984. It really is this reality where one plus one is four. And if you say it enough times, it makes it true. It makes it true. And it's dangerous and it's scary. And you would think that this pandemic would be the occasion that would bring people together. How many thousand people have to die before the folks who just stubbornly want to adhere to their way of thinking, even if it is flat out wrong? How many people have to die before that happens? How many ironic cases of guys who say, I'm not afraid of no COVID and end up dying from it before we wake up and realize maybe there's something to be concerned about? Herman Cain, do you think that provided the awakening or the reckoning for any of the COVID truthers out there? Probably not. See, we developed a sense of pride and ownership of our political views that has caused us to, to never relent to never concede. We are as wedded to our political beliefs as we are to our families. We are not giving it up and we will never entertain giving it up. And every discussion, every interaction isn't about processing information and considering how that new information may affect our viewpoint. It's about finding the information that supports our viewpoint and twisting, distorting, 
or flat out ignoring the information that contradicts our viewpoint. But our viewpoint is all that matters. We are a nation of people with viewpoints. That is how we identify. And even if it means we engage in ridiculously reckless behaviors at the behest of charlatans in politics and or the media for whom I continue to believe there be, will be a special place in hell for leading so many people down a clearly erroneous path. It's just sad. And uh, merely saying those things will get people upset. Even though what I just said is the 100% truth. Anything, it's like, it's, it's like, I don't know what it's like. I'm just tired. And I think a lot of us are tired. And maybe that's what some want us to be. Those who are committed to truth, those who are committed to accuracy, those who are committed to reality, if you continue to force feed distortions and untruths and bastardizations of reality, maybe the people who get it just eventually just give up. I don't know. Next question. Happy note. Next question. Should have saved that one for the end. At all happy teams, if the Lions won two games without Matthew Stafford last year, they draft ninth and 41st instead of third and 35th. If he's healthy, was his injury a long-term win? I see what you're saying. I mean, this is kind of indirect tanking. They get better. They draft higher because of Stafford's injury. I Look, yeah, I mean, if he's healthy and if he can still keep playing and if he plays at a high level and they can find a way to win games, you know, every year with the Lions, you go into the season thinking, hey, maybe this is the year. And then they sometimes do something early on that teases you into thinking maybe it is the year, and then it all falls apart. Last year it was that injury to Stafford. If he stays healthy, if Jeff Okuda ends up being a worthwhile replacement to Darius Slay at corner, if Matt Patricia can get enough guys to buy into the Patriot way, hey, look, in this year, there's going to be that dumb luck, that roll of the dice, the team that just gets lucky and doesn't have an outbreak. And I don't know, it's going to be a combination of luck and a combination of a commitment to doing all the right things, but there are teams that are going to do all the right things and they're still going to be unlucky because this virus can't be seen. This virus is invisible. This virus is going to pop up wherever it pops up. But the teams that find a way to combine preparation and luck, those are the teams that are going to be standing when it's all said and done. And maybe it will be the Lions. Golden Arch 17, how will the Sunday Night Football show look this year? Will you be on set? No final decisions have been made about any of this. And the one thing that NBC has done very well, number one, is communicate. And number two, be flexible. I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, but whatever we do will be safe for everyone involved. And ultimately, it will be an effective broadcast, whether we are in the same building or not. And really, when you see some of these broadcasts now, like the NBA broadcast last night on TNT, where everyone's spread out like those old scenes from a house with a giant dinner table and you've got the husband here and the wife all the way at the other end of this giant table. It's just awkward to have people that far apart. I mean, doesn't it make more sense to have people in different locations and put them on screen where it looks like they're closer together? If you're not close enough to interact, what's the point of being in the same room? So those are all decisions made by others at NBC. I'm ready to do whatever I need to do. My preference, obviously, is not to travel, not to have that extra stress, not to jump on a commercial airplane every week. Um, and uh, I think that's going to be a common belief that anyone who's in the NFL in any capacity with a team, with a network, wherever you want to be where you're going to be all year long. I'd much rather just go to Connecticut and be there all season than go back and forth every week. That's for damn sure. But, you know, whatever it is, it is. And hopefully it happens. Hopefully there'll be a season for us to cover. And I, I've been around NBC long enough to know that the production there and the executives there will be committed to ensuring that whatever makes its way onto your screens at home will be every point and an appearance standpoint as it is in any other year. Maximum overdrive with the Antonio Brown eight game suspension. What's the over under on number of games he plays for the rest of his career? Will anybody sign him with the newfound certainty or will he just be blackballed as he's been for the last year? He was blackballed for the last year because of the concern to be on the commissioner exempt list. I think somebody's going to sign him now. I think it's going to be the Seahawks. I think it's going to be the Seahawks. Unless they get Josh Gordon. They'd like to get Josh Gordon. Remember last year when they signed Josh Gordon, the report was it was Gordon or it was AB. They went with Gordon because he was available. 
Well, we don't know when Gordon's going to be available. We know AB is going to be available after the first half of the season. So you sign him. Now, whether you bring him in now or whether you wait, we'll see. But it's better to get him now because then he's on your team. If you wait until the suspension's over, there may be a land rush that emerges then. Because think of this. What if somebody's top receiver is on the COVID list after eight weeks? What if Mike Evans ends up with a serious injury this year and Antonio Brown's available? I guarantee you that even though it's clear Bruce Arians, who was with Antonio Brown for a season in Pittsburgh, wants nothing to do with Antonio Brown. If Chris Goblin or Mike Evans go down for the season, Tom Brady is going to jump on the table and he's going to yell and scream, I want Antonio Brown, and he'll get it. I think the only thing that is keeping the Buccaneers from signing Antonio Brown right now is the fact that they have too many good receivers, and it makes it easier for Bruce Arians and Jason Light, the GM of the team, to say, we don't need this guy. If that changes at any point, I think Antonio Brown is going to be all over. Another question from I don't know 40 What do you think AB's chances are of making it back in the NFL? Problems seem to have disappeared, and he's a draw. I think he'll be back. I think he'll be back. I, I Now that the NFL has ruled and it's an eight-game suspension, I, I think he'll be back. I don't know, 40, with another question. I got a theory the Cowboys didn't sign Dak because Jerry is going to try to get Aaron Rodgers. What do you think? Well, Mike McCarthy's the head coach of the team now, and if we put any credence or credence in Tyler Dunn's report last year, uh, the excellent story that laid bare some of the friction between McCarthy and Rodgers, I don't know that that is the place for Aaron Rodgers to go. I don't know what's going to happen with Dak Prescott and the Cowboys in 2021. I don't know. But it's going to cost $37.68 million to apply the franchise tag to him again. And with $175 million likely in cap space, boy, that becomes a lot of money to put in the hands of a quarterback. But if you don't have Dak Prescott, who are you going to get? What are you going to do? Remember, the Cowboys used the highest possible franchise tag this year to keep Dak Prescott in place. They believe in him. They want him. And unless he gets seriously injured this year or completely falls off, I think they're going to want him again. Paul PJ5, a great question. With all the defensive tackles opting out, do you think running will be more prevalent this season? It's an intriguing thought. Now, I don't know that so many defensive tackles are opting out to make an across-the-board push for more and more and more running of the football. But game-specific offensive planning if you're playing a team that is without its number one choice as a stuffing defensive tackle, you may see that team get tested more in the running game. I, I think so, especially if more and more of these larger guys who play defensive tackle choose to opt out. Golden Arch 17, another question. Is there any limit to how many people a team can travel with for away games? I, I think that this year there are going to be specific limits. You've got tier one, tier two, tier three access. And, and I remember seeing, and I don't have it in front of me, but there were, in the initial protocols that came out in June, who can and can't travel. And I think that, that it's going to be trimmed down to the absolute necessity. They don't want anyone beyond the minimum they need in order to pull off the game. So, yeah, there will be a limit this year. I just don't have it in front of me. All happy teams are alike. What's more likely, the Niners finish last place in their division or the Lions win their division? I'd say it's more likely – that the Lions win their division. I can't envision the 49ers in last place in the NFC West, although it is the toughest division in football. I think Kyle Shanahan will always find a way to keep that team competitive. I think it's more likely the Lions find a way to the top of the NFC North, just because I think that the Packers, for a team that was 13-3 and three and an impact player or two away from a Super Bowl to take the step back that they did, that's going to linger. The Bears, who knows? The Vikings are in this combination, rebuild, reload, hold it together, but also replace some parts. I'm not sure how that's going to go either, but it, it's it's a close call. All right. I think that's it. Uh, one last thing. We wrote about this earlier today. The officiating. The NFL and the NFL Referees Association have not yet decided on the procedures for officials opting out. They have agreed that the crews will be based on geographic connection. The goal will be to have as many officials as possible drive to the game site, not fly. At the end of the day, though, whatever the opt-out procedures are, and when you consider how many players have already opted out, 
I won't be surprised if we have a surprising number of officials opt out. A couple of reasons. First of all, you can take a one year break in your officiating career and then come back because you're going to be an official for a long time. Secondly, a lot of these officials, middle aged or older, they need to be more concerned about the virus of all the other things you're already worried about, which is primarily not being trampled on the field. Now you got to worry about maybe catching the virus out there in the fray. As you're traveling from place to place, you have no home games as an official, unless they can find a way to construct this. So, and, and it's, it's impractical to have a high percentage of the officials just basically roll to the stadium. And are we, are we going to tolerate that too? Look, we're going to have to tolerate a lot this year. Are we going to tolerate the possibility of every time the Steelers play at home, they get the same crew. Every time the 49ers play at home, they get all the guys who live on the West Coast. Are we going to deal with that? I, the same officials on a regular basis. The NFL likes to spread it around. This year, that may go out the window. This year, we may have five or six person crews. This year, we may have replacements who are called up from the college ranks, from the high school ranks. It may look like 2012 in that regard. Remember how bad that was? This year, we're going to have to tolerate a lot. We're going to have to accept bad calls. And you know what? When a bad call happens, and we know it will, the response should be, hey, a bad call is better than no call. It's better than no game. That sense that your team got screwed is preferred to the reality that your team is sitting at home doing nothing while there's no football to watch. So this is going to be a strange, strange year. And I think there will be plenty of officials who opt out. They also have other jobs. They're not going to go without money. This is a sideline for them. See, if they were all full time, maybe they'd be less inclined to opt out. But they have other professional pursuits. And this effort by the NFL to basically, you know, make it cheaper to have officials by not insisting that they be full time employees could sting the NFL when it's time to figure out what the opt out procedures are and whether or not these officials will opt out. But I won't be surprised if they do. Um, it's not like you're going to get replaced. You have rights under the union. You know, if you're a player and you take the year off, you uh, run the risk that your coach is going to decide, we'll just keep the other person. I think the NFL Referees Association will ensure that if one of the top referees says, I'm out this year, he's going to be back next year and the NFL is going to want him back next year. That could really screw things up. On top of everything else, I mean, think about it. We got 1987, 1982, 2012, all jammed together in one. We're focused so much on the players. We haven't really focused on the officials. And there's a chance there's going to be fewer officials than what the NFL needs. And they're not going to be the best officials. And there isn't going to be an end after three or four weeks like there was in 2012. This is going to be the way it is all year long. But uh, whatever it is, again, bad football is better than no football. Bad officiating is better than no officiating. We continue to hold out hope that we will have 17 weeks of regular season games with few or no postponements, suspensions, or cancellations. That's what we want. And please, please, don't come around here with this idea that because we're pointing out the things that could go wrong and maybe the things that the NFL should do better as some sort of a sign that we don't want football, of course we want football. I've been a fan of the NFL since I was a little boy. You think I don't want, I mean, I don't know how many more years I have left. I'm 55 now for crying out loud. I want every year of football I can get. I want to enjoy it. It's the way to get through those months that are just kind of dreary and, you know, the sky's always kind of gray and it's getting cold and the days are getting shorter. And the thing that gets you through it until the holidays is knowing that night you've got NFL football to watch. It is a great rhythm to the months of September, October, November, December. And I don't know what I would do without it. And I don't want to find out. And one of the reasons that I've been pointing out what's going on in baseball, what's going on in other sports, what's going on here, what's going on there, is to make sure that the NFL is taking this seriously and doing what it needs to do to ensure that it will get the games in. I don't want this constant sense week in and week out, day in and day out, whether or not it's going to work. But you know what? I have a feeling that's what we're going to have.
That's part of what we got to get used to. This extra layer of maybe there's going to be an outbreak. Maybe this team can't play this week. Maybe the 1 o'clock game has to move to 8 o'clock because the 8 o'clock game can't be played. Maybe a game that otherwise was going to be played on Thursday can be played on Monday. Maybe we got to move this game to when the two teams have their bye weeks. I mean, it's it's uh, it's going to be a strange year, but we're going to be here for it every step of the way. We appreciate your time as always. Enjoy the weekend. PFT Live returns on Monday. Profootballtalk.com. No days off. Around the clock. Constant updates with everything that's happening now that the teams are in camp. Hopefully, the outbreaks can be kept to a minimum, and we'll be ready for football September 10. Texans at Chiefs and then the first full Sunday and here's hoping that it works this grand experiment of the National Football League we're hoping that they can get it done and uh, we hope that you'll be with us every step of the way have a great weekend we'll see you on Monday hi I'm Mike Tirico and thanks for watching make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports